I guess uh, all of this sort of leads us to this, this search for exoplanets. I guess it's all leading me to think about the search for life within the universe. I guess we're all intrigued by that. I wanted to sort of ask you all where you stand on that, Masood. I, I wanted to ask you, I'll put you on the spot. I'm not very nice to you. <laughs> Where do you stand on the search for life in the in the universe at the moment? We haven't found anything. We're looking hard. Where do you think we're going in the future? Uh, so I think it's not so much about the destination, but the journey. Mm -hmm. So the more we explore space, the more we find out about ourselves. So the life that we're looking is right here. Mm -hmm. um, I have no doubt that there are other intelligent life forms. I mean, like. The, you know, in, in all the in all the universe, um, if there is no life, it's a waste of space. Yeah. <laughs> mm, but it just feels like there has to be yeah. there has to be something. Um, I, I think it was an Arthur C. Clarke quote. He said two, two terrifying possibilities: yeah. that there is life in our space, and that there is not, mm. and both are equally terrifying. Yeah. Um, I, I was discussing something called Fermi's paradox earlier on, which is a little bit technical. It's just kind of the universe is very old. There are very many stars. Um, and why don't, you know, surely we should see something. But my first thought when I came across this was, what would you expect to see? So if someone were looking at us, what would they expect to see with any of our equipment that would indicate intelligent life. And it's a really interesting one. It's one of these philosophical things you can use to argue anything. And while we've got a sample of one, all answers are equally likely. The thing is, though, I think the simplest answer to Fermi's paradox, which is a question of where are they and why aren't they talking to us? Well, you know, they're receiving home and away. There's probably a very good reason they're not talking <laughs> to us. But we've been broadcasting to space powerfully enough for instruments to detect for maybe 80, 90 years. We're already stopping doing that because it's much more energy efficient to broadcast point to point where a lot of people will be listening to this through cables on the internet or through satellite things beaming point to point. We're no longer broadcasting unidirectionally, so we're going silent already. And so it's, what that will mean is in the history of a planet that's had life for at least three and a half thousand million years, we've been broadcasting to the universe for less than a century. It's a tiny window and there'll be a little bubble of sound going out into the void and then nothing. And why would they talk to us? You know, and it's, there's an entire universe out there. They're not going to be sat there watching us going, come on, they've developed soap operas, it's time to strike. Um, one thing I think really interesting, I think the odds of us finding intelligent communicative alien life is very small, but I'd almost get really science fiction here and say, I think we're more likely to find silicon-based life than carbon-based life in terms of intelligent communicative life. And the reason for that is if you look at how we're exploring space, what we're doing is we're sending robot envoys out to the universe to places we can't yet send people. We go to the moons of Jupiter, we go to Uranus, hopefully in the 2040s now. And the further we go from home, the more autonomous our spacecraft are gonna to have to be. And you get to the point where if things like Project Starshot come off, this idea that you can send spacecraft to other stars, to get any meaningful data, they are gonna to have to be built in such a way as to have a rudimentary intelligence because they'll have to make the decisions on what to image. Because if you send a message back from Proxima Centauri saying, I'm here for three days, tell me what to look at. That will take four and a quarter years to get to Earth, four and a quarter years to get back. By that time, you've already missed your opportunity. So the logic then follows that as we explore space, we will send spacecraft out in front of us that are essentially sentient. Mm -hmm. There'll be spacecraft that definitely have a creator and that'll be us. If other species follow the same template, and again, with a sample of one we don't know, I think there's a likelihood that if we found intelligent spacefaring life, it would be silicon life that is a descendant of carbon-based life. But it's all science fiction and we love listening to this until we find it we don't know. Mm. There is a huge amount of interest in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and also the search for extraterrestrial artifacts. And this is one of those great areas where science asks a what-if question with no expectation of ever knowing the answer. But there are people out there who are genuinely doing research saying, with these great surveys we're doing with JWST, with Gaia, with all these things, we could find Dyson spheres, civilizations far more advanced than our own, building material around stars. The odds are that we never will, but if you don't know what to look for, you can guarantee you'll never find the answer. I was going to bring up um, 
Tabitha Star, that that was yeah. one which had probably a false positive, but yeah. it would definitely be in the region of something what we we would look for for and, the Dyson and sphere. The whole point of this work, and there's people doing it, is thought experiments. These are places we could see our own technology going far down the line. If other species do this, what would it look like? And the reason you do that is because we build these immense catalogues of bonkers amounts of data, petabytes of data, which contain oddities, contain really weird things. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what you're looking for, you'll never find it. The odds of finding it are very small, but if you explore it, you can rule it out. And that's really powerful. Mm. Um, there's also been a fair bit of talk that even humans didn't originate from Earth, that we are ourselves from different planets and that we've, we've sort of come here. Earth I'd clarify that that's going back a real long time. We're not saying that we arrived in the 1950s fully formed. Yes, yes. Um, panspermia. Uh, did, you want to, did you want to touch on panspermia and how... I'm not really an, an expert in panspermia, okay. but I'm happy to hand it off to John T. <laughs> I'm not always diving on anything. I'm quite happy yep. to bluster my way through. But panspermia is this fabulous idea that for a long time was viewed as being like the domain of crackpots, cranks. The idea that bacteria could be transferred between planets. So it's essentially like, don't go near the Earth, it's got humans are contagious. But at the bacterial level, the idea is that you have bacterial life is really robust. It can survive in a very wide range of environments. Mm -hmm could it survive transfer from one planet to another? And therefore you get the reign of life and planets inoculate one another with life. Once it starts somewhere, it spreads. And everybody thought that sounds utterly stupid. Yeah. But then you do experiments. You say, well, let's go put bacteria on the outside of the International Space Station and leave them in the vacuum of space for 18 months. And then to bring them inside and see if they grow. And guess what they do? Brilliant. You say, well, how do you get them off the planet? You've got an atmosphere. You that just doesn't work. And then people do experiments looking into impacts and they show that big impacts like the thing that helped kill the dinosaurs create craters and the rocks nearest the middle are shocked and destroyed and the rocks near the edge are barely touched. But somewhere in the middle, you've got this sweet spot where you can eject rocks through the hole that the space rock has punched in the atmosphere intact without sterilizing them. So you can get bacteria into space, you've shown they can survive in space, and a fraction of those rocks land on other planets. Well, we know that because we have at least 10 meteorites found on Earth that are Mars rocks, Martian meteorites. We found a terrestrial meteorite on Mars, potentially, possibly, probably not, but possibly. You know, we found bits of Mercury, bits of the moon on Earth. All of this goes together to say life could be transferred. Go back to the early solar system when you had three Earth-like planets, Maybe life got started on one of them, and at one point you had life on all three, and it was transferred back and forth as the planets were periodically sterilized, but instead going on the other one sent back. Which means if we ever do find life on Mars, there's a really fascinating thing we learn from that. If we find life on Mars and it has a shared origin with life on Earth, that shows panspermia works. What that means is once you've got life in one place, a bit like COVID, it spreads everywhere, the alternative is if you find life on Mars and it doesn't have a shared origin with Earth, that means you had two planets next to each other in the cosmos and life got going on both and therefore life must be common. Yeah. And that is huge. That, that awesome. revolutionises what it means to be alive. And I'd like to think we may get that answer in a lifetime. I'm a real optimist. I think there's a very real chance we'll find life on Mars. The harder question is whether we find life on Mars that isn't actually shared heritage with us. Yeah. Mm, it, it's definitely going to be interesting. And the, the, the one problem with the panspermia is the interstellar problem. Although we did have, I uh, can't pronounce its name. Maybe you can, the Uki. Umau Mau. Oh, so we've had two interstellar objects so far confirmed passing through the solar system with the advent of the Vera Rubin Observatory. Mm, yes. We're going to find many, many more. Mm. Umau Mau, despite the best efforts of a crazy Harvard self-publicist called Avi Loeb, <laughs> um, who is a huge problem for our science because he's selling books on the back of everything being aliens. Um, this is not an alien spacecraft. It's a small fragment of an object from around another star, but all the headlines have been aliens because that gets reads and it. Yes, I get grumpy about this. We also then had Comet Borisov, which was the second interstellar object. And it makes sense. Our solar system is shedding comets like dandruff to space. Comets from the solar system 
we'll pass through the solar systems, of course we're going to get visitors from other solar systems passing through our own. So I was just going to say, I also thought that the comets had um, some some of the uh, not amino acids. Comets, prebiotic chemistry is yeah, what they call it, yes. yes that, that's what I was all, all the bits and pieces, yeah. All the bits and pieces. The ingredients for life are everywhere. Yeah. You know, oxygen and carbon are two of the most common atoms in the universe. I think you said it perfectly. Hopefully within our lifetime, we might we might, if we're lucky, be able to see where we came from.